Okay. All right, I guess. Can you give me a thumbs up or some kind of indication you can hear me? Here? Or anyone out there in? Yeah, all good. All right, perfect. Thanks. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, good. Um, all right, so I'm going to share the screen. Do you want to you have any announcements or anything? Yeah, just for the PL. Stuff. Yeah, no, no sweat. Yeah, you go ahead. Let me let me get this started here. Maybe you stand back here, you'll get in the microphone better. Right on. Okay. Okay. All right. Sure. Go ahead. Quick announcement. Hey everyone, so a couple more quick announcements. Uh, we have posted the TA office hours. Uh, they should be on Canvas now. Let us know if you have any questions and concerns. Second, uh, for this week, uh, Amin is not hosting his office hours on Thursday. He's hosting them on Friday on Zoom at 6 p.m. because he's traveling right now. Okay, that's all. That's it? That's the answer. Okay, great. Uh, did everyone try the, the MATLAB? interactive assignment thing and i found it frustrating i don't know what you guys said so so we got some emails from folks saying hey can we get partial credit or how do you know if things are wrong i uh basically you have to get the exact image is that the way it works I mean, otherwise it won't it won't give you any feedback it just says not you're wrong i think is that is that the way it works oh he's not listening okay um anyway <laughs> How how did it go with the the MATLAB assignment? What about it? Well, I, I was getting emails from people saying, "Hey, how how do I get partial grades?" Two, is it because um, you can do all of this coding and then it just comes up and says, "No, that's wrong," right? So yeah, I, I think we will need to discuss this with Professor a little bit. Uh, for this, I think this is the only one that has to be exact. Right on the money. Yeah. Oh, the okay. The matrix has to be similar. I see. Uh, I see. So unless you got every pixel exactly right, it yeah. just said, no, that's wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which is, which isn't great feedback, but <laughs> what I would say is go, you should go into um, your own version of MATLAB there and, mm -hmm. and play around and plot yeah. things and see what's happening to get actual better feedback than, than what's popping out of the thing. Yes. So I think your image one might just be off by like a pixel yeah, or two. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Are you getting? Okay. It's just because it, if you put it in as like the take whatever image they created for the first one, yeah, and then apply the Gaussian to that and call that correct, yeah, then if you do it that way and get partial credit, but that's not how it's set up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll take a look into it. Okay. Okay. But I, I feel I, I think the the two and three images are based on one. Mm -hmm. So if your one is exactly. like a pixel yeah. off, I think your two and three will also be a pixel right. off. But if you set it so that, that way, like you like you get the wrong answer in the first one, and you guys just apply the Gaussian to that and call out the correct answer, then you can see if your second and third are correct, right? Right. right. Independent yeah. of the first. Right. Okay. Yeah. I have just like a tip. I think I struggled with this because the correct answer has a pixel like this cross off center by a pixel. Yeah. So it's at like six and four, six eight four instead of six. That's what got me through. Right, right, right. Oh, I, I think the problem is because in MATLAB it starts with, uh, with one. One. So you should have the image as one to one twenty nine, so which is right. the one to one twenty eight, and so it should be at the center of sixty four, sixty four. Yeah. So no, wait, right? Yeah. So it's one to one twenty nine. If you divide that exactly in half, it's supposed to be sixty five. Sixty five. But the request is that sixty four. Yeah. So yeah. A little off. Okay. So that, that's one of the things about uh, discrete stuff. If you want something centered on a pixel and you don't want it sampled twice with like a peak that happens at zero, you don't want two samples either side of zero. You, you want to center the thing up by one pixel. So you shift the whole thing one pixel. We'll look at that in terms of sampling, right? It kind of makes a difference, right? Where, where you actually sample. I'll add some tests where it will check for like a pixel around that. Okay, yeah. cool. 
but it i i guess one of the frustrating things about that you know process is you get so little feedback as to why it's wrong which is can be a little frustrating we were all frustrated <laughs> yeah uh, i don't know which so yeah, for the offline part, it's, uh, either take a screenshot of your code and your outputs and send it that. If you use chat GPT or any other programming language, if you take a screenshot of those and post like whatever info you provided or input to the chat GPT. Also, the speakers also the or, or your sure. code. Be sure, code, figures, whatever makes it easier for the person looking at it to see if it's right. And if you use any of the, like, uh, so my when I copied, I just copied the comments. Tom Tom wrote all those comments up there. This is what you should do. So I just like copied those, stuck it into chat TV four, just the comments. I didn't do anything, right? And it made the code, but it made a mistake. It it when it when Tom said use a Gaussian, chat GPT used the official Gaussian, not the one that that uh Tom put in the code, right? Which is like divided by whatever width or something like that. Chat GPT four said, no, that's that shouldn't be which it should be two sigma squared width, right? To to make it an official Gaussian. And so like, you know, so you the, the test stuff, right? If you're right, right. If you're paying attention. Right? It's like, <laughs> oh, okay, I guess I should do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is right. It's just yeah. like very uh like what happens in the real world. In the real world, that's right. So it just it just comes back such and failed. You're like, yeah, oh exactly. great. <laughs> yeah, it failed. All right. So we we're pretty far behind on schedule in terms of lectures. So if we continue to fall behind, I, I'm not that concerned in that. The um recordings from last year. Are, are online and I'll put them at the bottom of the slide. They're in they're in there. And so if we don't get to the end, I'll just say, look, you should you should watch the last 12 minutes of that recording because there's slides in there that you should probably uh, see. Okay. But I I really like the using this time actually is a good time to get questions, burning questions settled down, right? So that so that we can actually uh, look at those. So uh, I think we finished here. Uh, last time, uh, let me get rid of this floating menu. Um, and this was, it, this looks very similar to the diagram about producing x-rays, but this is in fact how you, x-rays get absorbed by the patient, remember. So coming in from the left is an x-ray photon that we have created from our x-ray tube, right? And it's going to interact with matter. And there's two basic, uh, categories here. One is photoelectric effect and one is Compton scattering. We can start with Compton scattering first. Comes in, it it gets very close to an electron. The photon has a glancing collision with an electron and scatters off at an angle. Okay. And then this can eject an electron from the outer shell. This photon can interact with anything inside the atom, right? The nucleus and electron. And as long as this angle is high enough that that scattered photon misses our detector, we're in good shape, right? Because really all we want to do is cast a shadow by absorbing these photons. And so the probability of getting a scatter here at different angles um, is variable and as long as the angle is high enough such that when that photon hits the thing in our detector called the sc anti-scatter grid, which really is lined up so that it only gets photons that go straight through, right? Anything that comes off at an angle, it will absorb it. That's the purpose. We'll take a look in detail at that thing. So this is Compton scattering. The other uh, uh, process is called photoelectric effect, where the incident photon comes in, kicks out a photoelectron by knocking it out of an orbital. And if that orbital is a, a low orbital, that it the, the atom, when it refills that orbital with an outer electron, a lot of energy can come out. 
of the atom, it can come out in two ways. It can come out as radiation, as another photon. It can come out actually as an electron. This packs more energy because you've actually got an electron which has, you know, a rest mass and it's coming out with a certain momentum. So those two mechanisms are uh, successful ways of absorbing the incident photon. Yes. Okay, and so there, here's the formula for the probability of those two events in terms of the energy of the photon itself and the uh, you know atomic number, the size uh, of the atom or the nucleus. And so the probability of the photoelectric effect goes it gets much higher, obviously, as you get a bigger and bigger atom and more electrons. Uh, but it drops off as the energy of the photon cubed. Okay, so as the energy of the photon gets higher and higher, this effect, uh, the cross section for a photoelectric absorption is lower. Um, the cross section for a uh, Compton scattering goes as the the size of the uh, atom but it's not terribly uh, dependent on energy. And a better way to look at this is to look at a diagram of the uh, mass attenuation coefficient, which is you know, linearly proportional to whether or not this thing gets absorbed uh, versus energy. So we have energy down here and the energies we're interested in in X-ray imaging are sort of between 30 keV and 120, 140 keV down here, okay? And we'll look at two um, uh, mechanisms. One is photoelectric, and that's this line right here, right? And you can see, whoops, sorry about that. You can see as we uh, get to higher and higher energies, the attenuation coefficient or the probability of absorbing that X-ray through this effect goes down precipitously, right? As we're getting to 120 kV from 30. Compton scatter is this curve right here. Right, and over our range of energies, it's relatively constant. Okay, so the probability of a Compton event occurring is constant as a function of energy. It's not constant as a function of material. It will change for different materials, right? Because that Z number changes in the atom, but as a function of energy, it's, it's constant. And you can see that there's potential here to make two pictures in a patient that the two x-ray pictures look quite different, right? If I took a picture at say 50 keV of this patient, I would have this much photoelectric absorption, this much Compton. If I then take one at 120 keV here, I virtually wipe out my photoelectric absorption and it's all Compton. So now I have two mechanisms. I have a Compton scatter image and I have a Compton plus photoelectric scatter image. And those two images look different. Different tissues light up in, in different amounts. And so now you have an image which is two-dimensional, right? It's got two axes. And so I can plot a position in that space of where a tissue would land in that space. So it gives you another degree of freedom to make a final image that is some kind of linear combination of those two images. Um, so this is, it's called two dual energy x-ray. It was invented a long, long time ago, and it uh, has been used. Uh, almost every scanner now allows you to do this. You can take a picture of one energy and another, combine them uh, to try and isolate different tissues usually. Uh, one application is to isolate the contrast agent that is in the, the vessels and try and suppress everything else or vice versa like eliminate the contrast agent in your display and look at the background uh, materials. Uh, this is a good project, right? If you wanted to select a project for the CT part, dual energy or multi-energy, uh, and it overlaps a lot with photon counting uh, CT. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind for doing a project. If you wanna know more about uh, a dual energy X-ray or multi-energy X-ray, so here's a quick diagram again of our system. We have a source of x-rays up here, which we looked at in detail. Ideally, that source is a point function, but it actually in reality is not a point function. It's usually a rectangle on a target. Uh, the x-rays 
in, come out of the target uh, and then pass usually through a piece of aluminum or copper to eliminate the very low energy x-rays that would only give dose to the patient, wouldn't cast a shadow. So here we have uh, all of the x-rays hitting the patient. We have an anti-scatter grid right here, right? And that's if through Compton scattering, an x-ray comes down here, hits uh, a nucleus or an electron here, and then comes off at an angle, it will hit the scatter grid and be absorbed. It will not cause a flash over here. That flash would be confused with x-rays that are coming along the straight line through here. So ideally, we only, if we look up through this anti-scatter grid, we see a very narrow window of directions that we can see things, photons through, and it goes straight back to the target. Okay, that's the purpose of the anti-scatter grid. And then in the old days, you would have a substance here that the x-ray calls a flash. And in the very old days, this would be actual photographic film made by Kodak and Fuji and people like that. And it was a big piece of film that, that went in under the patient. Very expensive, actually. They made a gazillion dollars making these cassette systems and developers and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and then the films were actually hung on a light box that was like a huge rotational light box. And so the uh, physicians would sit in front of this light box and the films would come up and they'd read and they'd push the next one and they'd read those. And my early mentor at Hopkins, a guy named Elliot Serhuni, he and, and Elliot Fishman, when they were residents, they used to have a contest where when you, they first went in the reading room for the day and all the cases were loaded up and they would sit in a chair and they put their foot on the pedal such that the thing did not stop and they would read and they'd see how many they got right right? Just by letting them go by and they'd look and look and, and, and make calls. And then they'd go back and actually do it for real. But you get really good at this stuff, you know, if you do it 10,000 times. Um, so the intensity of the flash or the intensity of the signal that comes out of the detector, is going to be proportional to basically two things. This is intensity. Uh, the energy of the photon that hit the detector, because if it if it has more energy, it's going to cause a brighter flash. It's going to cause a higher voltage if it's directly detected. And how many photons are hitting, you know, per second, basically the fluence, right? So it's the fluence is per area per second, right? And uh, so here's the number of photons per area in a unit time is, is the fluence. So we can increase the fluence just by increasing the current that's in our x-ray tube. So it just makes the x-ray light brighter and you just get more photons coming through, right? Now, to do it uh, very accurately, you need to know what the relative amounts, you know, of different energy photons are coming out of your uh, tube, right? So if I set the voltage on my X-ray tube to 120 kilovolts, and I'm gonna accelerate electrons across that gap, then the highest photon I can get coming out of my, my X-ray tube is 120 kilovolts. And you can see when I set it there, I don't get that many relative to the others, but they're there, right? There's a few at 120, but then most of them coming out are down at these lower energies, like 60 keV, 40 keV. And this is the relative number as a function of energy. That makes life slightly complicated, right? Because the amount of absorption you get at a specific tissue is dependent on the energy of the photon. So there'll be different absorption for all of these different energies. And that, so if you really want to do an accurate simulation of x-ray imaging or CT, you need to know this function. And mm -hmm. most manufacturers don't give you this graph, right? If you ask for it, they say, well, you know, we like to keep that sort of our own. And so you have to go and measure it or assume it's something. Um, and so the fluence is really the integral as a function of this function, which we're going to call S of E. This is energy here. And it's just the integral under that function, the total interval, you know, of this S function. And then the intensity, we put that 
energy back in there is E. And so this is the intensity. It's the integral under S times the energy DE. Okay. And that's the size of the flash or the intensity of x-rays that you're going to detect at your um, detector. So how does the, uh, how do you model the absorption of the x-rays or the relative absorption of the x-rays in order to create data that you can make an image from? Simply the, the you know, a chest x-ray is one shadow, right? So it's just, you just have one picture and it's, it's a shadow. However, the x-ray as it passes through the patient hits many different tissues on the way through, right? So depending on that summation or that path through, you're gonna get different intensities at the detector. So how do you model how many x-rays get absorbed by the patient or any material? Let's say we have this material here, we'll call it water for the heck of it, right? And the, a thousand photons hit this width of water. Okay, we'll, we'll call this a millimeter of water, right? Well, actually, no, more is gonna come out. Let's call it a centimeter of water, okay? And on this side, 800 photons emerge from this stuff because 20% of them got absorbed, right? In that one centimeter path. Then if I replicate this material here, so that 800 hit, then 20% get absorbed. I get 640 out here. If I replicate the material again, exactly the same width, same material, 20% get hit again, and I have 512 here, okay? When you plot this, you know, these numbers as a function of, you know, distance along this target, uh, you get a very nice mono exponential decay, right? And so this is the function. It says the number of photons at any depth through my target X. So X is the depth through the target is proportional to the number that hit the outside of the target, right? With an exponential decay with this coefficient and the depth, okay? And so that's that's nice. That's a very simple function, right? And phenomenologically, that's you can do this for many materials, and it and it is correct. Okay. Uh, Jerry uh, Prince in the book, if you want to read around this equation, he does it in a explains it in a slightly different way. He gets exactly the same answer, uh, but it's just a first order differential equation, just like uh, if you have a you know, a hot cup of tea and you put it at an ambient temperature, you know, how does that tea arrive at room temperature? What does that function look like? And it's this, right? It's just a simple exponential decay uh, with a baseline that's such that it goes back to equilibrium with the outside. So here's the equation. This is the fundamental equation that we're gonna use for CT, for the underlying physics of how we're, we're gonna work out what the picture should be. And it turns out that when we display our picture, our CT picture, right, it will be a picture of mu values, right, as a function of position, right? And that's that's what we're gonna solve as our CT image is mu as a function of position in space, okay? So these values differ in different tissues, right? So in water, they have a specific value in bone, have a much higher value such that you get a higher decay as a function of depth, et cetera. And one concept that uh, most engineers that work in this field keep in their head, as opposed to mu values, a table of mu values for different tissues, is a half value layer. And what that means is how much of a specific material do, do I need to drop the number of x-rays by 50%? And so how much water do I need such that, you know, by that depth, I'm at 50% of my photons left, right? And that's called the half value layer. And then it's easy to think, like when you're trying to figure out what's going on with your scanner and you look at your object, you know, you know, where those half value layers are. You, you can kind of put calipers up there and see, oh yeah, that at this depth, I'd have 50% of the photons, 25%, 12%. You know, six percent, but 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 oh, they're all gone, and I'm not out of my <laughs> out of my stuff, left. right? So that's called the half value layer. It's a very simple equation, right? You just plug it into that previous equation, 
And uh, the X value there is now the half value layer such that you're at 50%. And we'll look at a couple of half value layers so you get an idea. Um, this is at 68 KEV. Uh, that number is not an accidental number. That is probably kind of the average of this curve, right? So it's the center of mass of this uh, density curve. So 68 would be right here. So let's let's talk about uh, absorption of x-rays at that energy. Um, x-rays at lower energies will be absorbed more readily, at higher energies less readily. So it kind of averages out, right? Uh, so here at 30 keV, 50, 100, and 150, in order to have a 50% reduction in x-rays in muscle, so say heart muscle or in, in your muscle in your skeletal muscle, that's 1.8 centimeters at 30 keV. So that's not too deep, right? That's that deep through muscle, and you're at 50% of your photons already at 30. At 150 keV, you have to go 4.5 centimeters to get to 50%, right? Still in all, 4.5 4 centimeters, when you look at it, it's not that far, right, to get to 50%. If you're going, say I'm going through my left arm, then into my chest, through my spine, out here, through my right arm, and hit the detector, that's many, many centimeters, right? So we're dropping 50% to each one of those. So this is why when you, you're making CT images, often there are views when you're looking at the patient and there's a very long pathway through the patient, you will see the detector kind of run out of photons. It'll, it'll get really noisy all of a sudden and there just will be a few photons detected at that angle for certain lines through the patient. And that, that's okay, but you have to deal with that, those noisy spots, right? They will spread out and give you artifacts in your images. Okay, and bone, you can see, because it's more dense, um, has much shorter half-value layers. Uh, this definition of contrast, remember we looked at this and I said, well, sometimes it's, it's actually helpful to do your contrast instead of just signal difference divided by noise, look at signal difference as a percentage of the baseline or the background. And when you write down how many photons you're going to see uh, along this pathway, which we'll call pathway A, versus this pathway, which we'll call B, right? So there's a, a change in depth of delta Z here. And if you define contrast in this way, this percentage contrast way, which is A minus B over A, write down all those things and you get a very simple formula, right? So it's just one minus whatever the extra attenuation is here, this exponential minus new z. So it's a it's it's a very clean way of, of looking at contrast in x-ray images. So let's uh, continue down the pathway of discussing what happens when the x-rays are going through a sequence of tissues on a pathway through the patient, right? So this x-ray coming from our target, which is somewhere up here, enters the patient's chest or all of the x-rays along this beam are entering the patient's chest here and traveling along this straight line to get to our detector over here. Right? So they're going through chest muscle, a little bit of fat, then muscle, then perhaps part of a rib here, and then air essentially, or lung tissue, which is mostly air, then some kind of solid thing here, more air, and then out, out here. So how do you model that? Well, we can write down quite simply uh, how the number of uh, photons that are emitted from the patient here by integrating the uh, sort of stepwise attenuations through the patient and modulating the linear attenuation coefficient as a function of space, right? So, if I drew a function of linear attenuation coefficient, a 1D function along this line, that is going to be this function, and we're integrating that thing as a function of depth down here, right? So uh, if, say, this is zero, here's the zero in the integral, and let's call this x, which is the exit point of the patient, 
I've integrated that through the entire patient, right? So that's how much attenuation we're going to see. Yeah. Ah, okay. Thank you. Great. So the question is, this constant just popped up. What the heck is that? What is N0? So N0 are the number of photons that hit the patient here. Okay, so if I say in, you know, 20 milliseconds or something, I get that many photons, then for that 20 milliseconds, like how many come out of the patient? So this is the number that hit the patient. So N0, we can change by increasing the current in our X-ray source, and then the N0 will go up, right? So that's the incident number of photons. The interesting thing also with N0 is that usually you want a way to measure uh, what would N0, what would this number be at the detector if we had nothing in the scanner? So you, if I, if I set my MA to say 100 MA in my tube, and I, and I set the kilovolts to 100, you know, my energy, the kilovolts to a certain setting, uh, normally every morning, we're going to do that at many, many settings and calculate what N0 will be for those different settings. And we just keep it in a table, right? And that's called the essentially the air scan of, and it characterizes our detector, it characterizes our output from the tube, right? And so N0 is empirically measured. Um, okay, so the intensity at the detector, we just, you know, now, we know that we can integrate here across the spatially varying mu values uh, to get the fluence of the uh, uh, x-rays at a given depth, right? That's when we're including this function that gives us the relative amounts of x-rays at a specific energy, right? And normally, instead of doing that, we uh, just replace this term with an average energy. So if, if your attenuation is very high for low energy and very low for high energy, and it's a line like that, you can just take the average by picking the middle point. And as we saw before at 68, so image, you know, data like this is sort of at the average energy of that bulge, you know. Uh, so here, this is mass attenuation coefficients for different materials. You can look these materials up at this website. It's a U.S. government website. You can look up almost any material and they'll have the mass attenuation coefficients. They're normally, instead of, you know, if, if you look at the equation, the, the value of mu should be in inverse centimeters or centimeters to minus one. It's like how many E drops do you get per centimeter? That's that's the actual mu value. Normally, when they publish these, they'll normalize to density of the material because you know air has such low density. So what what is its mu value? Well, if you compact it together, and normalize it such as the same density of muscle, you get this value of mu. Right. So the these are usually published as uh, mu values normalized to density. You can see they're all pretty similar, right? We, we, we have water here, bone is higher. And the, the true mu of bone in a person is much higher because uh, it's, it's just much higher density, uh, muscle and brain, et cetera, okay? But those are, you know, you can see why you're, you use half value layers. They're easier to remember <laughs> than, than these numbers, right? Okay, yeah. So when you say fine, so the question is, these are average values for, well, water, well, average water is like distilled water, but muscle, what the heck is muscle, right? So it, it's, there are many types of muscle. Uh, I don't know how they decided what 
muscle to use. It probably is in the footnotes of the table said, this is skeletal muscle in a human or something like that. But you're right. It would change with uh, many things like sort of density of iron and stuff like that in the tissue. Yeah. Uh, so for like pure training and not at the beginning, like of each day, they do like a scan without anything in there. Yes. Um, so how much does it vary? Okay, the question is for the air scan that's done every day, when they go through all the different MA and all the different energy and they take a picture of air, how much does that vary day to day? It's 0.001% or something. It's really low day to day, but scanner to scanner, it's not. And the reason is the detector scanner to scanner is different, right? So basically you can make these detectors have a constant gain to within a certain range, like 5% or something like that. But from detector to detector, you will see a difference. And we'll see in the raw data, I'll show you a picture of the detector and detecting air, and you can see the pattern of the gain. And so you need that for your scanner, right? But once you've got it, it doesn't change a lot day to day, Not ideally. Because small errors in CT tend to blow up, right? So if you have a, a, we'll see if you have, when we look at artifacts, if you have just a half a percent error, but it's on every view that, and there's a thousand views that adds up and, and you start seeing streaks and things in that, or you see, or you see these ring artifacts and stuff. So, yeah. Okay. It's a good question. Um, so here's a table or a graph, I'm sorry, of uh, the linear attenuation coefficient. And so this is not normalized. This is in uh, inverse centimeters uh, for different tissues in the body. And obviously the con relative contrast between bone and muscle is better at 25 you know, keV than it is at 80 keV or 100 where we image. However, none of the photons get out of the patient. So you don't scan down here, you scan up sort of up around here, okay? And then you can add, remember, a contrast agent. And so this hypake is something you inject into the patient's vessels that has fantastic attenuation, right? So it's much higher than the surrounding soft tissue and that's why the shadow looks so good. And then this uh, barium sulfate mixture was what that guy was drinking in the the example we saw in the introductory lecture, and it it also has very good attenuating uh, characteristics. This jump, so so we see we have a linear attenuation coefficient at a very specific energy. It jumps up by almost a decade, right? It's much there's a much more attenuation all of a sudden at a specific energy. What happens at this energy in this material, uh, which is iodine, is that Anything greater this energy has the capability to kick out a K-edge electron, right? Anything lower than this energy, that photon cannot eject that K-edge electron. And so the cross-section of that event goes very low. Uh, but once you are able to do that, then you start absorbing a lot more photons at that energy. And these are called K-edges. And uh, you can imagine that if you were able... Look, it's pretty low energy here, so you've got to be careful how you do this. But you can imagine if you imaged around here, above and below the K edge, you would see quite different, you know, pictures. Oh, here's our friend uh, who's going to swallow uh, his barium uh, milkshake to to get these uh, lovely pictures. Uh, and here's the this is Hypake the contrast agent injected into the vessels. And you can see it's casting this fantastic shadow, even in these tiny uh, side vessels along here, uh, you know, you can, you can see them in the background or the contrast between them in the background. Um, okay. Same thing happens in the brain. If you're looking for you know, an aneurysm in the brain, you inject contrast and uh, and look for these uh, this contrast. And there's, you can imagine if you did a, a an image where you take one picture just above the K edge and one picture just below the K edge, 
the K edge is in the agent only. It's not in any of the background tissues, right? They don't have that same K edge. It's particular to the contrast agent. And so now I have two pictures in which the contrast agent changed its contrast considerably. Nothing in the background changed. So what should I do with those pictures? Subtract them, right? And now all I have left is the vessels, right? All of the X-ray absorption from the background is gone. And so this is digital subtraction and geography, which everything in the background disappears and you just see the vessels, right? So that's pretty cool. Um, up to this point, uh, or up to about two years ago, commercially, uh, all CT scanners used a, a material that basically caused a scintillation or a light flash uh, when x-rays came in and were, were absorbed by the material. Uh, you tried to keep that light contained in a column by putting septa in the material. And so this was a detector element, you know, an x-ray would hit it and you get a flash and you don't really want the flash to leak into here. You'd like it to stay in here such that the, uh, you know, photodiode for this detector element uh, went off and gave you a positive signal. Uh, each one of these detector elements is on the order of one millimeter in dimension, okay, in both the Z direction and the theta or X, X, Y direction. Yeah. So do they have to deal with like heat from uh, the, when it hits? Like, Not really. No, no. They, if, if you're heating your detector up with x-rays, you got bigger problems, right? Because you've, you've really heated up the patient, right? So, yeah. So you, you're, you don't want, you don't want to work at that, that intensity. Um, you, yeah. Oh, the scintillation is the method by which you detect the X-ray, right? So without the scintillation, the X-ray goes undetected, right? So in this in this technology, which is 99.999% of all CT scanners in the world right now, and digital X-ray systems, the X-ray hits a material that has been designed to flash when an x-ray hits it okay and then and then after that it's all light and so all the technology after that is just photodiodes and all all of that stuff right and so your voltage coming out of here you know it's sort of standard technology exactly the photodiode reads the light and it integrates up how much light is there and so if it's if it's a lot of light it was a high energy photon or it was a lot of photons right all, all at once Right. And this uh, technology will be replaced eventually, like, you know, in 20 years, probably 50% of scanners will will have what's called a photon counting detector in them. And uh, what happens here is the x-ray comes in. It actually uh, interacts with this material, the semiconductor, uh, to produce electrons, not not light. Right, and so the electrons are like a little pop of them, and they go straight uh, to this uh, detector here, right? And uh, so it's voltage coming coming out of this thing, right? So the electrons come here, and it's current, like direct direct current on your detector, as opposed to a photodiode integrating all the light, right? Um, so you can imagine uh, here, you do, you don't see septa for one thing, because you don't need to worry about the, the light spreading through the entire uh, detector or crystal, right? So what happens is the x-rays detected, these charges are created and they just go straight to this the diode here, right? And um, the, the nice thing about not having the septa is your efficiency goes up because you don't have things dividing you know, your detector elements right? And you get a much higher precision uh, detection as to where that occurs. Not only that, you can determine the energy of the photon that arrived by the amount of current that comes out of this thing, right? If you're detecting them one at a time, then you know what the energy of the photon was that hit. So you know, is it a 68 keV photon or a 1 in 20 keV photon or et cetera, right? 
So now we have a spectrum of energies we can we can detect uh, with our our detector directly. So that's called photon counting CT. I if people want to do projects looking at the difference between integrating detectors and photon counting detectors, that's that's something that's very topical right now. Yeah. And that's if you have like the pixelated anodes. So what, what kind of prevents it from like scattering inside the semiconductor? Like, so you know it actually yeah. the right anode. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Like, I don't know why. Uh, just like fine enough if I have an X ray detected here, you know, it doesn't go to all of these. It just goes to this one. There's probably a depth. I'm not sure this is drawn to scale. <laughs> right? uh, they usually don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but this technology, every vendor. I think has their own detector design. Okay, so it's a hot topic in X-ray imaging is like making better detectors like this, these photon de counting detectors. Uh, one of the issues with them is, is charge pileup. So if the number of X-rays starts to get overwhelmingly large, such that instead of this nice interaction here in a shower of electrons, I have 50 of them, and a shower of electrons, then the charge piles up on the anode and it, it just can't like detect anymore, right? It gets saturated. And so you need to make your detector work in a range where there, there's differential you know, ability to do that. So this is straight out of the Siemens website. So they, they have a white paper and everything in there. And, and there's a lot of uh, papers that have been written over the last decade from physics labs because a lot of X-ray physicists have been making their own photon counting detectors to prove the technology. And that's now moved into uh, commercial production. Phys uh, Siemens has the uh, first really workable photon counting system. It, I believe is only, again, it's 64 slices instead of that 256 or 328 or whatever like that. So that's photon counting. Uh, this is the detection system for the system we have here, uh, which is an integrating detector, traditional detector that has uh, this fluorescent material on, on the surface. Uh, and this thing here is the enter scatter grid over top of it. And so there's 128 detectors along here. You can see there they come in little chips and they, they insert in here. Each one of these is one, two, three, four, five, six, six, 32, right? Detectors along here in this direction, because this is 256 from here to here. And that's in the Z direction of the scanner. So we're looking sort of along the side. Uh, and then this is a two dimensional scatter grid such that when I'm sitting at a detector right in the middle of this thing, when I look up, I only see directly to the, the source, right? So you can kind of see the depth of the uh, anti-scatter grid. It's pretty, pretty large in this case. Uh, did I? Oh yeah, this, I can't, wait a minute. You guys wanna go see it on the web? Well, I'll, I'll let you do that, okay. Sorry. There it is. So there, if you go to this website here, you'll you'll get some really cool animations as to how this detector system works. But we're in lieu of the time we need to get going. Okay. Okay, we're done. Um okay, so that's you know the sort of basic x-ray physics uh, that we're going to do up till now. And now we're going to start looking at essentially linear systems or the signals and systems aspect of, of imaging to get some groundwork in uh, such that we, we know what we're talking about in terms of point spread functions and Fourier transforms and things like that. So any, any lingering questions about x-ray physics? It was a pretty fast shot through x-ray physics, but... Okay. So the slides for this have been posted um, for the lecture you're going to see now. And 
they haven't changed much just just tiny little changes uh and the video from last year is here okay so many sources okay uh <clears throat> so this is essentially what we're going to visualize right is a two-dimensional function okay so x in this direction y in this direction the relative brightness or the relative the number here you know the brightness as a function of position is what we're going to call f x y it's our function that we're trying to uh, create right so it's an image uh, but in all of the math we're going to call this image probably f x y right uh, in two dimensions it looks like this in three dimensions it can be just a cartesian grid you know a block in 3d and if we extract out a plane we see our two-dimensional image here it has different dimensions in x y and this is called slice usually is the z direction oftentimes for both mr and ct x and y when you the first images come off the scanner before you reformat them and stuff like that most of the time x and y are sort of right and left right and anterior or posterior and z is usually or um, yeah slice is usually in the z direction right those are called axial images this is an axial image however for both mr and ct you can cut this up in any orientation you want right so it's a true 3d function right and so we're gonna so <clears throat> first we'll just talk about what we're going to understand at at the end of this lecture where we're headed with this and what we really want to understand is how we mathematically describe three things how do you mathematically describe the input to your system if you're if you want to know the properties of your system how do how do we set up functions that are input that's going in the system how you how do you describe the picture of that input on the output of your system, right? And how do you describe the system itself? What the system did to this input to create this output, right? If this system, and I've built systems like this, where if you, regardless of the input you put in here, this is zero, right? Those systems exist, I have made them. <laughs> they didn't last long. You move on from those systems. But that's a possible system, right? Other systems, like a little dot goes in and what comes out, it's not a dot, but it's a blob. And it's a blob that might have sort of wings, you know, with oscillations out there. But it, it's, it's not, uh, you know, a delta function. So we're going to learn how to build input functions, right? Uh, usually with... Fourier coefficients, right? And and in a in a linear way, we'll add up those those Fourier coefficients to get a function here. Pass that through our imaging system to figure out what the output image is going to look like. Okay. Once we have that, and we we know what our input was, we can measure our output. At that point, we can mathematically describe what the imaging system is doing. Right. And in very general terms, like, does it blur the object? Does it, you know, decrease the amplitude of certain frequencies in, in our object, et cetera? And remember, a very important concept, we're going to review it because we already looked at this, but a super important concept is the point spread function. It's also called, and we'll interchangeably call it, point spread function and uh, impulse response function same if i say impulse response that's what it means it's the point spread function and for ct we had a little ballpoint out of the ballpoint pen that was much smaller than the voxel that we use to display pictures and it produced an image that is a blob okay and the width of that blob characterizes how much blurring occurs by your imaging system right and that's the impulse response of the point spread function so how do you make mathematically this ballpoint pen ballpoint? So what is it mathematically? How it's the best function to use to describe that thing? 
Well, if I if I put that ballpoint in space right at the origin and I and I go along the x-axis, it's zero, 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 zero. And then for a very short period of time, it's non-zero and then it's zero, 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 right? So it's basically a, a rectangle function that is is very high, right? It's it's got a large amplitude, right? And you can think of a delta function, and this is what we're getting. This is how we mathematically describe this really pointy function, is that if I cut the width of that ballpoint, you know, of the of the little bead, I cut it in half and then double its density, I get a higher function and it's thinner, right? And then do that again. So I get a much higher function and it's thinner again. So in the limit, you know, as as we get thinner and thinner and thinner, that function becomes a delta function, right? So it's it's the height of the function gets higher and higher as my width of that function gets more and more narrow until finally it's a rectangle that's super duper high and really, really narrow. And that's what a delta function is. If the you this is really, if you want to look at the formal definition of what a delta function is, it's the function that when you multiply your image, okay, so I have an image, which is fxy. It's, it's a picture of anything just sitting there. And <clears throat> the delta function at the origin is the function such that when I multiply my image by that delta function and I integrate across the entire image, right, it pulls out the value of my image at one point at zero, zero, right? So that's that's the definition of what the delta function does. It sifts out a value of your function at a specific point, right? And in this case, well, it happens at zero, zero, okay? By definition, that's what the delta function is. Okay, is there any, any questions about that? So the, the visualization of this is I have a picture I have another function, which is a spike, right? I multiply those two functions together, then integrate, right? And it pulls out the value of the picture at that point. That's that's what the delta function is, okay? It, I think this was invented by physicists because it's kind of a weird function, uh, but it's very useful for engineering and physics, right? But mathematically, it's a little weird. Um, so here's the, you know, oftentimes the delta function is graphically uh, represented by something like this. You have the whole 2D plane. This is a two-dimensional. You can do it in 3D, you can do it in 1D. But this is a 2D plane and you have this spike, right, at the origin. That's delta xy. Uh, you can offset the delta function from the origin just by, you know, adding these offsets to the xy arguments such that the delta function hits zero, zero out here, right? The argument for this function hits zero, zero out here. at psi and eta, right? So we can slide that thing around and see how systems behave as I, you know, change my position uh, in the picture. This is a special delta function that sifts out values along a line, right, in 2D. So basically all of the x, y points that sit along this line will give us a positive value. And so if I multiply this by a function, I'll just get the function along that line, right? And that will be super important for CT reconstruction because we, we look at lines through the patient at different angles. And then this is a set of delta functions. And here's a, you know, this is what in the book, this is the terminal or the uh, notation they use where you have the delta function x, y and a definition of delta x and a definition of delta y such that every delta x, you get one of these delta functions. Every delta y, you get one of these delta functions. And that is called a sampling cone, right? So I, I could now sample my function at all of these different points by multiplying this and then doing an integral. Now I've taken a continuous 2D function, F, multiply it by this, integrate, 
And I now still have a continuous 2D function, but it only has values at where these delta functions exist, right? Everywhere else is zero. Uh, and so that concept, that function is really important when we look at sampling. It's like to, to actually sample f of x such that you could reconstruct what f of x was later, how many of these you know, points do I need? That's, that's one of the problems of sampling, right? So uh, <clears throat> two other functions that we're going to look at a lot. Um, and this, this as you know, these are tools. These are like the algebraic arithmetic tools that we're going to be using. One of them we use a lot is the rectangle function, which is zero up to some, like, let's call it one half from the origin. Well, it is one half. Then it goes to a non-zero value. Once it crosses one half, becomes one. And then when it crosses, uh, I'm sorry, when it crosses negative one half, when it crosses a half, it goes back to zero. So that's called the rectangle function. And you can imagine that's extremely useful if you want to window something. So you have interesting stuff, but you're really interested in a, in a certain domain. You can multiply by a rectangle function to get rid of everything and just look inside that window, right? And so that's what this is used for often. Yep. Yeah. Correct. Oh, that is a, oh no, they, I think this is the Y here, right? No, what's he saying? Zero for X greater than half. Oh, okay. No, this, this is a typo, right? Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. That has to go in the corrections to the book. Okay. We already have a list of corrections for this first book. So yeah, it looks like, unless we're, this is taken out of context, but because this says rect x, y, right? And so what he's, I think what we're doing here is taking it out of context. We're only looking at the cut through the, the y equals zero plane here, but that's, that's a good point. I'm sorry. We should cross this out for this diagram, cross out the y, cross out this y. Okay, we'll, we'll correct that in the slides. Or we'll make this a 2D function, which I think comes up next here, right? So, uh, okay, nice, good point, All right? You, you just, this just didn't look, just like, what is going on? You, you got a 1D function and there's a two arguments. Okay, good point. Um, <clears throat> okay, you can make it in 2D just by having, you know, uh, it's a unit square right, in the in the plane, right? And it goes up to y a half and y minus a half. But anyway, uh, okay, let's move to the next function, which is called a sink function. And uh, the sink function is like a sinusoid, it oscillates, right? And so it oscillates here with, you know, frequency one, right? Uh, and it decays away as you move away from the origin, okay? So, the height of these peaks are decaying away. The function is decaying away by this term, uh, but it's oscillating with a frequency defined by this, okay? Interestingly, as it goes to zero, right? As X goes to zero, it does not blow up, right? It reaches a limit, right? As uh, we, we get closer to zero because X and sine X both go to Y equals X as, as they come to zero. And so you get one at that point. Okay. This function is used continuously. I mean, we use it all the time as we do with this. And as, as fate would have it, if you take the Fourier transform, we'll see this, of this function, this is what you get, right, in 1D, right? So it's, for MR especially, when you're bouncing back and forth between space and Fourier space, Knowing uh, some of these transforms in your head is very important. And this is a primary one that a rectangle function gives you this in Fourier space. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, here's a uh, two-dimensional rectangle function, right? Which is the product of two one-dimensional rectangle functions. And uh, when you look at its Fourier transform, 
you can create a two-dimensional sync function, which is just the product of two sync functions, uh, one in X and one in Y. And so that kind of looks like a sombrero function in a way as it's, as it's going out. Uh, okay, so everybody knows about complex numbers. Uh, we're gonna use them a lot, especially in MR and uh, where we describe uh, the value of a function by its magnitude in the complex plane where this is the imaginary direction, real direction, and its phase angle, theta. And, um, you know, they these are used throughout uh, signal processing because it's important to um, uh, understand, well, it's, it's very useful in looking at uh, things that are dependent on phase, really, because you have these phasers. And so here the amplitude of this thing is just, you know, the Pythagorean amplitude at root five. And the phase angle is the arctan of the ratio of the y over x. Uh, complex numbers, uh, you know, defined j if you're an engineer, i if you're a physicist. Uh, when you square it, you get minus one. Uh, you can you know, use them just as uh, they are with any normal number. Uh, just whenever you square the thing, you get uh, minus one. And so uh, this, you know, just by multiplying as you would any numbers uh, in parenthesis, uh, you can get a real number here. This is three plus two J, three minus two J. When you multiply them together, you get this number. So uh, this, is the relationship between um, the, the, uh, this, a phasor in the complex plane, e to the j i, and cos and sine theta. So this, this relationship here is often thought of by many mathematicians as like the, the nicest equation in the world, right? The most remarkable equation in the world, that it works out this way. And uh, when you look at it and you say, well, wait a minute, e to the a complex, you know, argument, why would that have e is the banker's number, like right? it's 2.718964, right? So, and e to the x is this an exponential growth. So why would it have anything to do with cosine and sine, number one, right? And what's the relationship between the, the, J, the phase angle here and the, the phase angle up here? Um, and so when you're looking at where this comes from, if I have a unit circle in the uh, imaginary or in the complex plane, so I have a, a length of one, this number e to the j theta is has cos theta as its real component and sine theta as its imaginary component, right? It still doesn't, tell you like when when you're just looking at it in its raw form like what is the relationship between e and cos and sine right but the the one hint i think is that e to the x like is a function that when you take its derivative it's its own value right it's so that's a very special function right when you do differentiate it you get the, the function back so you can it's infinitely differentiable right and so is cosine and so is sine. So when you take the derivative of cosine, right, you get negative sine, take the derivative of that, you go back to cosine, negative cosine, take the derivative of that, you go back to sine. So it, it is infinitely differentiable as well. So the two sides of this equation are behaving the same in that way, right? That the, the, you can imagine it. And then when you write out the, you know, power series expansion of cos x and sine x, around the origin, see a very interesting pattern, right? In that uh, when you're looking at cos x, you start at one and then it decays down obviously, and you decay by a certain, you drop by a certain amount, go up by a certain amount, drop by more. And when you look at the sign uh, of these terms, x squared, you get a minus sign, and then x to the fourth, you get plus, and then x to the sixth, you get a minus sign, and so I need something that's going to flip the sign every other even term, 
right, to make this series work, right? So what the heck is that? I need I need an item that flips the sign every second even term. And you go, oh, I've got that. That's I, right? Or J, that thing, that's the periodicity of, of J when you're when you're putting it to even powers, right? So that's another reason why this you can think that this relationship uh, works, the Euler's relationship. But what we're going to use it for a lot is as a phaser, which is a unit vector, and it's basically spinning or in the uh, complex plane uh, with different rates. Okay. Uh, plane waves are another uh, thing that you need to be very comfortable with, uh, specifically in MR. And uh, so this equation, I'm sorry, it's really small here, but where we have a function of brightness in the plane, so our fxy is the sign of this argument. And there are two terms in this argument. There's a product of a mu naught in x and a nu naught in y. Uh, and if we look at what this function looks like in the plane, in the xy plane, as we change these two values, the mu naught and u naught. So if we set this one to one and this to zero, we get a sine wave, right? A full cycle sine wave, uh, if that is one here in x and it's constant in y. And so it doesn't change as a function of y, it's just we have a plane wave that's going along in x. If I double this constant value here, then I get two full cycles across, let's say this is one centimeter. Uh, if I make it mu four, then I get four full cycles across. And so th just by changing this number, this argument here, I'm changing the frequency of these plane waves. When I start changing the numbers here, right? So now I have four and one, uh, we get four cycles if I go just in this direction. However, now, as you can see what's happened, is with the one cycle in the y direction, it looks like a plane wave that's just shooting off in a different direction, right? So we've rotated this plane wave in this direction. Again, if I add two, we rotate it, it goes up this way. Add go to four, rotate it, goes up this way, right? So now when you project on the x and y axis, you get these frequencies, but it also has a oscillation as it's going off on, on y equals x, right? So this is the, the fundamental relationship that occurs in MRI in the sense that when you prepare your sample to listen or take signals from the sample, the first thing you do is you impose one of these relationships of the phase of the signal on the sample. You get this picture set up. You can imagine your, your brain or something is sitting in that field of view. You impose this phase shift on, on that brain, right? We're using gradients and things like that. And then you listen to the signal, right? And you, you get this set up first and then you listen to the signal. And so you're multiplying the actual patient by something that looks like this, which is pretty cool. Um, um, <clears throat> what did I want to say about this? Well, this is just the description of a 2D phaser, right? Uh, where we have that mu and u argument is the uh, frequency of the oscillations of that function in the different uh, directions. And, uh, oops, sorry, let me go here. Um, so this function here, right, is essentially what you're going to be seeing in uh, magnetic resonance uh, over and over. Okay, the output of a continuous system. So in the book, they use this script S term for our system. Uh, we're going to just use bold S because I don't have this on my computer. So here's our image, or this is actually, I'm sorry, our object, right? So it's that it's sort of the ground truth, underlying true uh, object that we're looking at. And then we capture it 
with our system, with our imaging system, and this comes out as our picture, okay? So f of x, x, y can be some beautiful pattern I put on the wall. I know precisely what the pattern is. I take some image of it and I get this, right? And we would like to describe what this thing is and what it does. And so algebraically, this is what that looks like. And we'll do one definition before breaking, and that is what is the definition of a linear system? So if I have my uh, imaging system S and this relationship holds, it's called a linear system. So let's uh, break this down piece by piece. I can create uh, a you know, ground truth signal F, X, Y by adding up uh, different components of F, X, Y. So suppose my final F, X, Y is the result of a set of K uh, images that are added up together with these coefficients, relative coefficients. So now I get a final image, which is F, X, Y, but it is the sum of all of these sub images that I've made, right? So it could be one sombrero and then a sombrero with a much narrower uh, peak, right? And then a, a linear function. I add all those together, that's my picture. So if I can break down the picture that way, it's, they're just a linear sum, right? When I take a picture of FXY, the whole thing, if it turns out that it's equal to doing this, which is taking a picture of each individual component of my summated image and then multiplying those by the same weighting coefficients, right? So it's fundamentally different, right? I've taken K images at this point and I sum them together with these coefficients. If that equals what I get when I sum up the pictures and take a picture with my system, then that system is called linear, right? And, um, this property makes life remarkably simpler when you are trying to manipulate systems and images, if this is true. If you can just separate out different sub pictures, like through sums, and you know that when they're all added together, you'll produce the same picture, right? Is that, that getting in there? Okay, good. So that's called linear. Um, so here we'll go back to our impulse response function. And this doesn't look like a dot, but assume this is a tiny dot, right? And I can now uh, create a either a point spread function, same as the impulse response function. But when I move my dot here, right, by changing the position of the delta function, right, with uh, psi and eta, so I change the if I need a new point spread function uh, to describe what happens when a dot comes in from this location versus this location, right? If I have to generate a new impulse response function for something up here, then that system is not shift invariant. That means I need a whole set of point spread functions. And the whole, and they're a function of, you know, X and Y but now they're also a function of where I am in the plane, right? Psi and eta. And in optics, this is, if, you, if you've had a set of cheap binoculars or when you're a kid, you had a really cheap microscope, you know that those systems are not shift invariant, right? You need to put the lens right on your target because if you go off to the edge a bit, it starts to blur, right? And so you have a different point spread function depending on where the object is in the field of view, right? And if that occurs in our CT scanner, such that my little ballpoint pen right in the middle of the scanner versus way off at the edge of the scanner produces a different point spread function, impulse response function, then that is not shift invariant, okay? And uh, most of the time when we're doing arithmetic slash mathematical analysis of images, we will 
multiply by a two-dimensional rectangle function to put us in a situation where we can make this assumption, right? Because it makes life a lot easier. If, if you don't care where the object is in the field of view to, to get the same point spread function. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. We'll start there uh, on Wednesday. Thank you.